we'd love to just kind of dive in to questions and be great um, if, if we could have our panelists please introduce themselves um, and basically their involvement with Columbia Venture Community as well as their Colum connection with Columbia. Uh, I would be happy to start. Um, I'm Linda Taverdi. I uh, have, I wear two hats right now. I'm the founder of a nonprofit tech organization called Daisy Debt. Um, we help low income consumers uh, protect themselves against predatory debt buyers. And uh, my day job is as a transaction advisor for Latera, which is a legal software company. I teach lawyers that technology won't bite them. Uh, I started my career as a, a you know, garden variety commercial civil litigator. I did that for about seven years and that was plenty. So and I bounced around for a little while, started a family and then decided to go back to school. And that's where I uh, started my connection with Columbia. I got a doctorate in history. Um, in 2013, it turned out to be a, uh, a legal history. So my, my involvement with the law has continued. Um, and uh, I also have um, taught classes as an adjunct with the Committee on Global Thought. I taught a, a course called The Future of the Global Economy and Society with David Park, who I think is still floating around Columbia faculty somewhere. I was also the interim, an interim associate director for a FinTech initiative with the Columbia Business School. And I've also served occasionally as a pitch coach and sometimes judge for pitch competitions, especially with SEPA. Um, so uh, let's see, I think is that enough? <laughs> Great. Uh, and hey, everybody. My name is JJ Sass. I am a current student uh, at Columbia. I'm a dual degree student getting an MBA at the Business School and a Master of International Affairs uh, in SEPA. Uh, prior to going back to grad school, I was uh, on the West Coast uh, in private equity and venture capital. I uh, was out there for just shy of four years uh, with a firm called Jasper Ridge Partners. And then prior to that, uh, was in New York at Goldman in a multi-asset class quantitative investing role. Um, so I've seen kind of the big investment bank opportunities uh, and a smaller um, private investment shop. Um, while being uh, at, at Columbia, um, I joined CVC partially as a way to, when I first moved back to New York from the West Coast, um, I had no real network here. And so CVC was a great way to kind of snap my fingers and, um, you know, have access to a New York uh, venture and tech and startup ecosystem. Um, and so while I've been here at Columbia, uh, I am a VC fellow at the business school where I've been working with uh, New Enterprise Associates. Um, and I also just launched uh, a startup of my own this week. Um, and so, uh, so that has been uh, taking up some of my time as well. And hi, I'm Stefan. I graduated from Columbia College with a degree in economics, and I'm currently working at a startup right now that connects VC firm. And in the past, I worked for a fintech VC. I interned at a biomedical engineering startup at Columbia that was actually funded by Peter Thiel. And right now I'm working with CVC and the Venture Engagement Program where we connect startups and VC firms and the startups are Columbia founded startups. And I found out about it through the Columbia Startup Lab, which some of you may know of, which is basically a cohort of different Columbia startups at a WeWork downtown. So yeah. Awesome. Thank you for the, thank you for the introductions. And so diving right in, I guess Columbia Venture Community really has a wide breadth of programming. And one thing we'd love to learn is what aspect of this programming has been your favorite aspect across its you know, social, professional, and kind of global dimensions? Yeah, I, uh, I, I would say the first thing, that, so the first event that I ever did uh, through CBC was one of the family dinners. It's actually uh, where Linda and I uh, first met. 
Um, and as I said, I had come from the West Coast. I had no real venture tech network uh, on the East Coast. My entire network was on the West Coast. And there were probably nine of us or so that all sat around a big table. Uh, and over the course of about two and a half hours went from complete strangers, not really knowing uh, what to talk about or, or, or to whom to speak uh, at the table to just this, this wide ranging conversation, you know, exchanging numbers and, uh, and, and having a real community. Um, I know it sounds kind of hokey and as mm -hmm. it's coming out of my mouth, it kind of sounds hokey again, um, but it really was uh, pretty magical what happened over the course of that two and a half hours um, with that small, that small setting. And, and it really set off uh, my great experience with, with CVC. I'll, I'll support you on that, on the hokiness. Um, <laughs> I, I, I joke to all of you non-tech people out there, I was a historian and a lawyer, and I just had this idea, you know, I had studied 19th century, how lawyers in the 19th century practiced. I knew how 20th century lawyers practiced because I did it myself. And I also knew that there is this enormous uh, persistent justice gap where we have uh, more lawyers than we know what to do with and not, and people that are going into court without lawyers in, in like vast numbers. And um, so I, uh, I, I, I just sort of like a, a little idea that tech might help, but I, I, to say that I couldn't code is such an understatement. Um, I, di I didn't know anything and I really didn't feel like I had any platform or, or entitlement or to speak about you know, entrepreneurship or technology, I went to a, ha a happy hour and I, I thought I could just hide and, you know, just see what was going on. And it was the most warm and open. Nobody, nobody asked me to justify why I was there. The fact that I was there was, just, was sufficient justification for me to be there. I was interested. I listened. I shared what I could. Um, so it, uh, it, it is not an exaggeration to say that the CVC gave me the courage and the community to start to, to figure out what my path was. Um, and now I'm, you know, I founded a tech company and, and working in a software company right now. So. Yeah, I agree. CVC has so many great events. I mean, just last week, there was an interesting webinar on health tech. And I attended the NYC uh, Cyber Tech Accelerator opening. And there are just so many events across all the different chapters. I mean, there are events in New York City, in San Francisco, in Korea, in London. And so I think just in New York City, which is sort of where I live and where I've attended events, there's, you know, pitch night, there's demo night, there's incubation nights. So I think that for whatever you're interested in, there's so many opportunities. And I've been so fortunate to be able to attend some of these events, the CVC board dinner, for example, where I got to speak with a lot of like-minded people. And it's just great to meet such a great community, meet so many people, learn so much from everything. And so, yeah, it's whatever, I think that everyone should go to the meetup page and see which events they would be interested in attending because there's just so many great things. Mm -hmm. And don't be shy. <laughs> if you are shy, it's all good. <laughs> and the other, the other thing that I found valuable was, uh, so last summer I was on the West Coast again. Um, working with a VC firm out there and, you know, again, wanted to kind of connect to the Columbia community temporarily while I was on the West Coast and CVC has a San Francisco chapter and, you know, was able to do that right from the start. And it, it's just a kind of a plug and play uh, network and, and, and more than a network where it's just exchanging, you know, LinkedIn invites or, or business cards. It's, it, it really is a community. Um, and, and, you know, people are really willing to help, which I thought was, uh, which was great. Yeah, and the willingness to help, it's not just like, you know, answer a question, make an introduction. People will dig right in. And I actually had, um, you know, uh, people would give me meetings about, um, you know, my idea. And even if it was something that they weren't really interested in investing or they didn't see the investment possibility for themselves, they gave me feedback, like, and not the kind of feedback that makes you feel bad inside, but it was really more like the feedback that a friend might give to you, a, a, an honest friend. So yeah, it, it's, it was, it's great.
thanks for providing a lot more color into kind of how each of you guys had great personal experiences with CBC. I know for a lot of a lot of us, it's like we're wondering whether or not um, we can stay engaged with with Columbia's like venture capital community post college, and so that's definitely a question top of mind is how you can get involved. And it seems like all of you've had a really great breath and and awesome experiences with CBC. Um, taking a step back, I I know that we are really staying in kind of unprecedented times. So, um, and given kind of the breadth of experiences represented by three of you as panelists, we'd love to hear about kind of your perspective on trends in technology and investment and your perspective about um, current events uh, surrounding COVID-19 and what's kind of going on and specifically the impact of that in terms of the tech and venture ecosystems. Uh, it's a small question. I'll just, I'll knock it, I'll shake it. <laughs> that, that, that is a very big question um, and it's a little bit out of my lane but I'm gonna, that's never stopped me before. Uh, um, so, um, let's see. I think, I mean, it's, uh, the co the, starting with COVID-19, I mean, there's some like uh, thing, some really interesting things that have happened in, around how people communicate and how they relate. Um, uh, so that, that's that's boring. Um, I think it will be really that uh, that the that how the, uh, how in I'm trying to put this in a way that doesn't um, that isn't too controversial. I think we're going to rethink how money works now. I think we're going to rework rethink how governance works. I think we're going to rethink how healthcare is delivered. I think a lot of things are going to change. And I think that um, the path that I don't, I don't know, I don't know, maybe you guys can tell me how, where capital, how capital is going to make good predictions about where to go. Yeah, Linda said something really interesting about the way that we communicate and interact. And I think what's happening in this COVID or post COVID uh, world is that all of the all of the abstract is now is now tangible, and what I mean by that is, so I've spent one of the spaces that I've looked at quite a bit um, from an investment side for the last six to nine months is the senior care, uh, you know, senior living and elder care space, and it was all very theoretical. Well, if we put cameras in the house or if we put these devices on you know, senior citizens' wrists or around their neck or, or whatever to kind of facilitate this monitoring. Suddenly, we need all of that. And suddenly, it's not just an abstract idea. It's my grandfather who has Alzheimer's is in, a, in an assisted living facility. My grandmother, who is, does not have Alzheimer's and is totally fine, is now living by herself at home. And I, as their grandson, have to worry about both of them and connecting to both of them and making sure that the we're able to stay in touch and we're able you know that i know that they're being taken care of and that they're getting enough food and so all of these things that were abstract ideas of oh i wonder if technology can solve this suddenly it's it's real life and it's something that when this call and this conference is over I have to worry about in real life. And I think that's, that's what's happening is it's, it's the, the, the wave is kind of going out to sh uh, going out to sea and you're, you're seeing what's really left behind. Yeah. Yeah. Just in terms of uh, concrete versus, versus abstract and theoretical, I I've been following um, some of the people writing uh, in the mo uh, modern monetary theory space and you know they're both for until uh, you know a month ago they're considered cranks, <laughs> so they sort of believe that 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 uh, that you know money is a is a is a social con is a is a political agreement and a social not a social construct but a political uh, animal a creature of politics. So you can you can print as you can spend as much money as your government is willing to spend, and you know. There are a lot of arguments about why that that sounds ridiculous, except that's what we're actually doing right now. And um, 
uh, Anthony Scaramucci said on a, a podcast recently that, you know, wow, I'm not a modern monetary theorist, but we're, we're all monetary, we're all MMT now, uh, because that's, that's the, what circumstances um, require. And so that's why I feel like I, I'm not in the investment space. And uh, a month ago, I, I can't imagine that people would have thought that cash payments to everybody in the United States was uh, was p politically feasible, and it w clearly is. So, uh, yeah. Andrew Yang uh, may have been a, a man before his time. I yeah, I actually <laughs> I I was really early on following his. I, I went to a fundraiser or something. I didn't do, donate anything, but I went to. Uh, followed him really early on because we talked about universal basic income in the class that I taught. Um, so yeah, and it, it was interesting as a first year, first year students thought that it was insane. The second year students were like, well, okay, I, I see what that is, but it'll never work. And then the third year students were talking about how. <laughs> so yeah, and just just to jump on to that, I think one of my major interests is fintech. And if you look at Scandinavian countries, they are running basically cashless societies where mobile payments take up, I think, like 95% of Sweden's, you know, transactions. And I think that, you know, money is one thing that I think a lot of germs and viruses can pass through money. So I think that this might also lead a trend to more mobile payments in America and other countries. And just in general, I think that COVID is going to affect the VC industry uh, quite heavily because I think that VC firms are less likely to deploy, deploy capital in the next few quarters. I think when I've spoken with a lot of startups and a lot of the funding that was you know, sort of committed isn't committed anymore and the VC firms are sort of holding off to see how this plays out. So I think it's definitely interesting to see what VC firms are going to do because they have to deploy the capital at some point, but it's a question of when given this crisis. And also the VC firms have to raise their own funds and I think they're having a lot of difficulty raising the funds from LPs. So it's also going to be interesting to see what the VC firms do. And also just from a startup perspective, I think a lot of startups you know, might not have enough runway to survive for the next few months. And so I think you might see a lot of startups just going under even if they were promising just because of this crisis. So it's also interesting to see how many startups will be able to weather the storm how many startups are going to be in a rush to raise funds right now. So I think that it's a very interesting time to see, you know, how this uh, crisis is going to affect VCs, LPs and startups in general. Yep. So I, do you mind if I ask you a question? <laughs> do you think that, um, do you think that the sort of drying up of some of the capital um, is going to uh, push VCs to just, to just pull back or is it going to, encourage them to look at non-traditional uh, entrepreneurs for like that edge. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. No, I spell it, it out a little? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, I think it's a definitely a combination of both. I think that definitely a lot of VCs from what I've spoken to them is that they're sort of holding off for the time being and that maybe in the next month or two when the economy opens back up that they're going to, you know, deploy the capital then, but also, that they might be more selective and you know maybe wait and sort of see if they can find better opportunities. But I think that Joseph has much more experience in VC, so maybe he can jump in. Well, I, I mean, I think it's there are two things that are going to happen, right? Is you're going to see all these valuations that were sky high and these ridiculous revenue multiples or or multiples that were valuing companies on things other than revenue or 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 EBITDA. You know, all of these are going to come down. But at the same time, growth projections and what these companies are going to do going forward are coming down, right? So it's, it, it, it could lead to a, a, just a lower equilibrium uh, or, you know, it completely dislocates the market. And I think what, what we're seeing now is a lot of these companies that three months ago were darlings of the venture capital space are saying that, you know, revenue is going to be cut in half for 2020 or even more, you know, down 70% and now are laying off 20% of their workforce. Are they going to be leaner companies coming out of that? Mm -hmm. Potentially. Um, and will that mean that, I, 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 guess the, I guess the point is we don't really know because we're still so in the, in the middle of it. Um, but I, yeah, I think it's, it's an interesting question of whether this will lead to rethinking the types of companies that VCs um, 
support. I, it, it very well could. Um, but I, you know, it's, it's, it's too difficult to know, I think, as the, as we're still riding the waves a little bit. Yeah. And, and I, and I think when it's, you know, it, um, a lot of venture capitalists seem to love to stand on the mountaintops and proclaim that they've, you know, they've, or they've been to the mountaintop and they, they, they have the good news. Um, Maybe, but I, I, I don't know that anybody has a great read on it. Yeah. Yeah, we really ap appreciate, I think, the breadth of perspectives you brought. I know this was extremely, extremely challenging question. I mean, <laughs> no one has a crystal ball and can predict this, but it's always interesting to hear about the kind of insights and the perspectives you guys bring, especially with the breadth of, breadth of experiences you guys represent. Sure. Um, on a much lighter note, uh, you know, Columbia students, they love reading the core. Um, and so we always are curious about um, what people like to read and basically what your interests are in terms of any podcasts, blogs, or books that you guys have for a recommendation, especially for students um, looking to hone in, learn more about business, uh, tech, and entrepreneurship. I will start because I seem to do that. Um, so for, as far as like podcasts, just um, related to tech, I think Recode Decode is just indispensable. It's accessible, it's fun, um, it's broad, uh, and it isn't super techy. It's very, very accessible. Um, it, for MIT puts out a, a whole bunch of different, really great uh, newsletters uh, around tech. Um, and then the last, the, and I, I'm, other people are gonna have better suggestions, but just for news, um, I'm finding that too much news is too much right now. So for catching up on just what the headlines are and what like the, the, the bullet points that you need to know, my favorite podcast right now is called What a Day. And uh, it's actually just, it, 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 imagine the New York Times headlines done by two pleasant, charming, funny people. <laughs> so that's my recommendation. Yeah, I, uh, I, I'll give a couple of mine. So I, I'm sure this is no surprise to any of the, uh, the students that are on, on this, but the Stratechery uh, blog that Ben Thompson writes and then his exponent podcast um, that he does is great. I think in terms of, uh, in terms of tech strategy and understanding you know, the, the chess match that's often being played, um, there aren't many people that get it better than he does. And so I think that's a, that's a good place to start. Um, as any venture capitalist who wants to ever get invited to another venture capitalist cocktail party, I have to say, uh, you know, the A16Z podcast, particularly their, uh, 16 minutes, uh, news podcast. I think they do a good job of kind of covering a lot of the, the trends in tech and, and help get you a little bit smarter about those things. Um, one of the daily podcasts that I really like is the Snacks Daily Podcast from Robinhood. Um, it's two guys that are in their, I think they're in their early 30s now. Um, and, you know, they, they, have, they cover three stories. It's 20 minutes every day. Uh, it's fun. It's kind of cheesy and corny, but in a funny way. Um, and so I, I like that one. And then there's a lot of really smart people who are putting out content on Twitter or Substack. And, and a lot of it is free. Um, you know, you have to sift through a lot of the garbage to get the good stuff. Uh, but there's a lot of really smart people out there that don't really have wide platforms, um, but are doing, doing some good work. And so you just have to, um, you know, be discerning about that, but, uh, but they're, they're, they're out there and you can definitely find them. Um, were you, did you ask, uh, Arnav for, for book recommendations as well, or just for, for podcasts and, and blogs? Yeah. Yeah. Book recommendations too. And the only reason I ask is I just read this book and I'm telling everybody that I know about it. Uh, it's called Infinite Powers by Stephen Strogast, who's a, uh, uh, he's a math teacher at Cornell, um, which I know we're not supposed to support them, but the book is fantastic. It's all about calculus and how calculus helps to explain the world. Super user friendly. Um, I read it about a month ago and loved it and have been telling everybody about it since. So I uh, highly recommend that. What was that again? It's called Infinite Powers 
in by Pilot Stephen Park. Strogatz. Okay, and I'm sorry, I didn't know we were recommending books. Can I recommend um, Technological Revolutions and Financial Bubbles by Carlotta <laughs> Perez? It's that's a, that's a beach read. Yeah, it's dense, but it, it's <laughs> really great. It's really great if you're, yeah. So it, it, it she uh, it has some fascinating theories about the relationship between technological innovation and, uh, you know, no surprise from the title, and but just w where capital flows uh, throughout this, the technological, the cycles of technological revolutions and, or, and um, it's just really pretty fascinating. Yeah, and I guess continuing with books, I think that Zero to One by Peter Thiel is um, an amazing book that I really enjoyed. And also The Hard Thing About Hard Things by Ben Horowitz is also an amazing book. Um, in terms of podcasts, I think that TechCrunch has amazing podcasts. And just in general, I think their website has some of the most amazing, you know, tech startup and VC content. So if there was only one website that I would pick to read, it would probably be TechCrunch since I think they have amazing contact and Crunchbase has an amazing database of different startups and VC firms. And then in terms of podcasts, I think there's the pitch by Gimlet, there's how I built this and also CB insights has an interesting podcast. But I think that what I did was I just searched venture capital in the podcast app. And I think there's about like 20 or 30 that are uh, really, really high quality. And then in terms of blogs, I think that medium has a lot of interesting content, content, um, a lot of, you know, VCs write, you know, pieces on it. So I think if you just search for venture capital or startups on Medium, you'll find a lot of uh, interesting content. And I think that, you know, the, like the founder of Union Square Ventures has his own blog. So I think there's a lot out there. You just sort of need to find, you know, your niche and then sort of dig down and find, you know, who's writing about it on the internet. So, yeah. Thanks for, thanks for all the recommendations. I'm sure that um, many of the attendees will like pick up and it's always great to hear about, um, especially now when some people might have uh, extra time. Um, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> I, yeah. I love how we all laugh there. Like, yeah, we should have extra time. But I don't know where, I don't know. I, I saw quickly, I, I saw a joke where somebody said, uh, it was, I was on Twitter, I forget who said it. And somebody said, how is it always 4.30? Yeah. <laughs> it's always 4.30 PM every day. I don't know, it's, it's just always 4.30 no matter. Yeah. <laughs> no matter what. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, I guess before we jump into like the Q&A um, questions, which a few have been answered already, um, but maybe there'll be more coming up there. Um, we wanted to also um, kind of circle back to CVC and I guess um, on a positive note, what's one CVC event that you guys are really looking forward to? Ooh. Uh, to the extent that we can start doing more family dinners again and, uh, you know, the, the, the demo days, just, uh, it sounds like a cop out, but anything in person, um, I think these are great. And I'm so excited that we were able to, to join for, for a video conference, but, um, and this goes back on off to the, to the mm -hmm. question you asked before about some of the macro trends. I think what we're seeing is the video conferencing platform and the work from home culture and all of that it actually gets us quite a bit of the way there. And there's probably, you know, it gets us 85, 90% of the way there um, for most things, but that 10 to 15% that we miss because we're not in person, I think um, is really valuable. And so while I, I love being able to work in workout clothes all day, uh, and, you know, have a seven step commute from the bed to the desk. Um, I think we're, you know, any, anything where we can sit around the table and actually see another human, I think would be something I'm looking forward to. Me too. That's my, that's the in-person events have always, I mean, obviously they're, you know, but the, um, there's a lot of programming, but my favorites are the happy hours and the dinners, especially yeah. the dinners, because it really is a chance to get to know people. I have met such great people at those dinners, present company included. <laughs> yeah, and I've always wanted to attend the dinner so that I hope that, you know, when this all passes, I can attend one of them and definitely the happy hours. 
and also all the other events such as demo night, pitch night, incubation night. I think that there's going to be a lot of exciting things coming sort of when this you know pandemic dies down. Awesome. Thanks for sharing. I think we can um, we can jump into the the Q and A's now um, that have been provided. So I guess um, the first one of the questions was um, this is like a small task type of questions, but this was for Joseph. Um, someone wanted you to repeat the podcast you suggested. Yeah. <laughs> sure. Um, so I suggested it was the um, the Exponent podcast, which is. Ben Thompson, who writes Stratechery, he has a separate podcast, which is free. Um, and it's called the Exponent Podcast, the Andreessen Horowitz A16Z podcast, and then their 16-minute news, which is a separate feed. Um, but, but both of those are great. And then the, uh, the daily one is the Snacks Daily uh, by Robin Hood. And it's, uh, it's two younger guys that um, just kind of talk about three news stories, three business or tech news stories of the day. Um, it's just a fun kind of light way to start the day. Awesome, thanks. I sure. guess just plugging along with the other Q&A questions. Another one is um, a CV, someone who's looking to get involved with CVC as an investor, I guess what your perspectives are on how, for everyone this is open, like how um, someone can get involved as an investor in CVC. And on the flip side, how you can benefit from the investors that are part of the CVC community as well. I think by joining this web conference or web uh, discussion, you know, that, that anonymous attendee has taken their first step. Um, so just continue to get involved, go to events, go to the happy hours, meet folks, feel free to reach out. Um, I put my, uh, Twitter handle in my um, in my name here so that if folks want to reach out you can do so on Twitter and then we can connect and I'm happy to connect you to any of the various projects in CVC that I'm working on um, and I'm sure uh, Linda and Stefan would, would, would agree. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Um, another question we have for everyone is um, this is again one of the more nebulous questions about trends but it's what do you think um, the future of private capital and kind of private markets is going to be um, with respect to, you know, less companies going public and and really kind of tapping into private markets for financing. Do you think that that's a trend here to stay? Or do you think that this is kind of a short-term reactionary trend? Wow. Okay. Um, I mean, it, it, it ultimately gets down to a cost of capital question and it gets down to who's the right buyer and is there some intermediary step between VC and the public market who's willing to hold on to a company into perpetuity? Um, I can tell you from some experience in that VC to PE continuum, um, it's really difficult to raise evergreen capital uh, structures that are going to hold things into perpetuity to provide the, the financial demands for that bridge. There are some groups that are trying to do it, but I think it's difficult. Uh, but a good case study for this question is Airbnb. Um, and rather than me trying to go into explaining it, um, there's a, a, a guy on, who has a, a good sub stack on this um, called non-gap, G-A-A-P. Um, if you look up non-gap sub stack, he, I think his most recent post uh, does a pretty good job of explaining the, the Airbnb situation, which I think goes to this question. Yeah, I think that there's been a general trend for the past few years where companies are staying private longer. I think that they're delaying IPOs because VC money has, has been so available. And I think that the uh, sort of, you know, bad thing that has happened is that, you know, SoftBank has been funding companies like WeWork, which have been losing a lot of money. And I think that if they went public, that all of their problems would be very evident. So I think that definitely this is going to maybe accelerate, you know, maybe VCs being more cautious about just funding, you know, companies in perpetuity, in perpetuity, in you know, like providing private capital forever. And I think that maybe IPOs might pick up again in the future. So I think that's definitely a trend we should be looking out for. If you want the long view, read Carlotta Perez. <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. 
Yeah, I know a lot of these questions have been kind of trying to look into a crystal <laughs> ball and just predict a very uncertain future. Um, a more answerable question, I guess, though, is um, what's the best way for people to connect with investors that are in CBC? Probably, um, I mean, I think, so in my experience, uh, um, the, the best events for those are going to be uh, they're not pitch nights, but they're, they're incubator nights where people can come, you know, you can come with just an idea. Um, you can come with a, a, a startup, you can come with an idea where, where the stakes are very low. You're basically explaining your idea or doing a little mini pitch and the people around the table will help you to refine your pitch, refine your idea, workshop it. Um, I think and I, my, in my experience, I haven't been to a ton of them. There are investors who show up to those. Um, and then obviously pitch nights. Uh, um, those are good because learning to pitch is a skill, is a, is a skill set that is separate from building your business. And it's important to know how to do it. I stink <laughs> and will probably just always have somebody else do it for me. But um but it's really good to know how to pitch, how to field the questions. Um, the better you get, the more likely you're going to attract the interest of investors. Yeah, I would, I would plus one that um, on, the, on the incubation nights. Um, I, I, went, I attended one probably two years ago now for the, uh, um, when it was just the, the startup that I just, launched uh, when it was nothing more than kind of an idea and a little twinkle in my eye uh, brought it to one of those nights and it was certainly helpful. Yeah, and I agree with all that. Just getting involved, attending the events, you know, and meeting new people, I think will help you grow your network, meet new people. And I think that that's invaluable, I think, in this industry. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and not, um, not seeing it as a transaction either. Yeah. Don't, yeah. don't go with the objective of, well, I want to meet this. I mean, look, I think we're all playing that game to some extent. You sort of have to, right? But don't just attend these, um, d don't, don't be so transactional about it and, and understand that it is a community and, and that um, you know, there will be people to support you, but to the extent that you can help other people, um, be willing and open to do that as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, you could think of it in terms of like a lot of, lot, in terms of you come with both sort of a, a kind of an ask and kind of an offer. Like what yeah. can you, what can you bring to other people? And even if it's just your sort of thoughtful uh, critique, that's okay too. Yeah, and developing relationships over time is really important. I think a common, you know, piece of advice is don't microwave relationships at the last minute when you need some help or something, but to develop relationships, meet new people and sort of, you know, just, you know, be friendly and be open and try to, you know, actually offer something. So I think that's good advice. Great. Um, there were also a few questions about specific involvements with CBC. So um, two questions for one was, how can someone get involved with the venture matching program um, involved with CBC? Another one was, um, are Columbia students allowed to apply for the VC fellows program? Uh, so I can take the, the point on VC fellows. So that is a, that is a program that exists within the business school. Um, so I'm, it's it's just a it's a it's a business school program, unfortunately. Yeah, and the the venture matching program. This is getting out members that are part of it would be the best you know approach for that. Mm -hmm. Awesome, great. So I think uh, another interesting question we have is: Are there any tips for introverts? looking to break into VC? Oh God, I love that. Uh, oh, um, yes. I, I think it's, you're gonna just have to push yourself a little bit. Um, find the people who, there are people in this 
ecosystem that are happy to just chat, um, that are introverts at heart. I'm one of them. Um, and I think when we see our, our fellow introverts around, we, we, are, we understand each other and we have empathy for it and um, just try to seek them out. I, I don't know that I have a great, I love the question and I wish I had a better answer for it and I'm not sure off the top of my head that I do. You can practice extroversion as a second language. Well said, that's, ex yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think that BC is somewhat technical in most, you know, roles. If you're doing a lot of modeling or something, you don't necessarily have to have a lot of client interaction, at least at the sort of lower rungs um, compared to, let's say, wealth management, where you're just dealing with clients and that's your job 100% of the time. So I think that just getting into these roles, having a good technical background, and then over time, you can sort of work with working on client, working with clients, you know, step by step. So I think it's a long road. And I think that people shouldn't be too worried about that in the short term. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, great responses. I think that's a really topical question with a lot of people who are interested in venture capital. Um, another kind of trend question um, before we, and with this, we can kind of close out the Q&A questions uh, to keep this to an hour before um, just asking for your kind of closing thoughts um, is what are your thoughts about healthcare IT specifically with respect to privacy issues? And the questions around, you know, teledoc, health, and telemedicine um, has been kind of in the regulatory backdrop. Um, but is, you know, kind of this digital health really sustainable in the long term, um, especially given kind of the data privacy concerns around it and regulation? I know this is a very, again, nebulous and challenging question, but um, proposed on the Q&A. <laughs> Um, I, it, look, I think people are, we're going to emerge from this willing to make sacrifices and willing to give up privacy. Maybe we're not, maybe we're not, maybe, maybe I'm speaking out of school, but my guess is a lot of people are going to come out of this experience willing to give up a little bit for what they think is a lot. I'm not making a normative statement about that. I don't know if that's, if that's right, um, but I think that it's true. And I think we, you know, it's, it's the Google and Apple uh, collaborating on the COVID uh, social tracking where, you know, they, they're able to use uh, Bluetooth data on your phones to check if you've been in contact with somebody that ultimately tests positive for the virus all kinds of privacy concerns there, right? Will people opt into that? I, I, I think now the percentage that will is going to be higher than it was before. I, I just given the sort of mass adoption of casual apps, I use Waze myself. Um, that kinds of, I, I, you know, the, the casual adoption of location uh, apps that track your location, find your f a phone. I mean, just all those kinds of things that um, the privacy associated with whether you've been exposed or whether, whether you've been exposed to COVID, it, it does seem uh, incremental and not um, different in kind to what people are already accustomed to, but I, I, that's a guess. Yeah. I think that HIPAA is a big concern. And I think that actually because of this crisis, HIPAA regulations have been loosened a little bit to allow more, you know, telehealth uh, services. And I think that in the future, I think with the adoption of more work from home, more, you know, Zoom meetings, I think that telehealth is also a next frontier because instead of actually For the phone and computer, I think that's definitely one trend, one trend that we have to look into, and whether that's going to develop over the next, you know, few months and years. Um, so, forgive my sort of ignorance on the, but how is um, uh, telehealth? How, how does that implicate um, HIPAA more than digital records, digital files of um, uh, medical records? Is it just that 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 um, the video platform is leakier or? 
Yeah, I think there's some HIPAA, you know, concerns with sharing, cloud, you know, patient information over video where other people might hear it or through a platform that might get hacked or something. So I think that in person, you know, there's no concerns, but I think that HIPAA, I'm not a healthcare expert by any means, but I think that, you know, there might be some HIPAA concerns with, you know, doing things virtually. Hmm. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks so much for your thoughts. I know some of these questions have been kind of a mixture of um, predicting, predicting the future and also getting your thoughts on, on just a wide variety of topics. But um, we, CVP and the Columbia attendees are really thankful for um, all three of you guys um, for answering this like very broad range of questions and introducing CVC to us. So we're really thankful again to Cortland, Linda, Joseph, and Stefan for um, being here. And so we'd love to close off. Um, if you have any closing words for the attendees, um, we'd love for the panelists to share. Um, I'll, uh, I will speak for the non-traditional, non-tech people. Don't, 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 um, don't hamstring yourself. If, you, if this feels like a community that you, you want to join, do it. You will find your path. Yeah, I, I, I would absolutely agree with that. Throw as much spaghetti at the wall as you can see what sticks. Some things will, some things won't. Um, feel free to reach out to me personally. I'm always happy to chat and, uh, you know, kind of welcome you into the, into the CVC community. Yeah. And just one final thought is that I think knowledge is the backbone. And so I think that we all recommended some great resources and there's just so many resources out there. So I think that, you know, finding what you're passionate about is key. So I guess learning more, finding what you're passionate about, and then using CVC as a conduit to sort of, you know, sort of explore your passions. And I think that C is a great platform and I'm looking forward to meeting some of you. Awesome, thank, thank you so much um, for those closing words as well. Um, yeah, I think this is everything we have planned in terms of the Q&A and the moderator section. We really enjoyed the panel and um, definitely I know a lot of undergrads and CVP members are going to be looking forward to joining CVC after learning about your perspectives and awesome experiences with the organization.